what matters uh, most right now is uh, your impressions of what you've heard um, and your thoughts about what you might want to do with any ideas you've got and where you think the uh, university ought to uh, go next. You have this strategic uh, um, priorities uh, and where I've been here to deal with 1.1 and as I've mentioned uh, to several groups, uh, I think you're at a critical window of opportunity here because you've spent, uh, you, you had a new president come in 2013, correct? And you went through the 100 days and uh, then you had a major uh, report on what was learned in the 100 days which is more comprehensive than anything I've ever read from a comparable chief executive officer coming in and reporting what he or her, what he or she uh, learned in that 100 uh, day period. Um, and then you've had the uh, annual updates on the 100 days listening. Um, I've also commented that, that I think this window of opportunity is uh, a function of the, the fact that uh, most uh, presidents who are of a certain age, um, they don't stay as long as some others. and. Uh, you need to show a lot of progress and give him and give him more reasons to stay, and uh, you know strike while the iron is hot before you have another senior leadership change. By the way, I, I haven't met your president. I don't know what his plans are. He could he could do what I did, which is to stay in one place 32 years. But unlike me, he could get another job. I could never get another job, so I stayed one place. But uh, uh, I do know that uh, those of us who work in institutions, we have to give our chief executive officers reasons to stay, reasons to not want to leave. And I know there's a huge correlation between institutional leadership stability and what can be done in innovation. One of the worst enemies of innovation is leadership turnover, okay? And we're very inefficient about how we handle that in higher education. So while, you, while this administration is still relatively young but stable, I think you, uh, the, the timing here is very important. Am I making sense to you? And I, I hope I'm not uh, verging in any territory that you shouldn't be speaking about, but um, you're all realists, okay. Now, when I work with an institution, I always look, I always, um, look um, for what I look for in my students. Uh, rather than looking especially at their, their weaknesses, I wanna look at their strengths because I think human beings and human organizations uh, build improvements on their strengths rather than on their weaknesses. So I, I, you know, before coming here and reading about you, I was asking myself what strikes me as attractive and, and positive about this place. And uh, I wanted to mention uh, a few things that I think are um, really strengths and, and then see how you build on those. Uh, for one thing, uh, your age. You're 198 years old and you're about to celebrate your 200th anniversary. And that's a, a great time for institutions to be thinking about how did we get where we are now? What are we? Who are we? What's the journey been? What are the key hallmarks, benchmarks along that journey? Um, by the way, you may have observed, I think historically, uh, this is a historical continuum. And uh, all of this is um, um, prefatory to, to, to your future. So I think you have the fact that you have a long established uh, history. Although you're trying to change in a number of significant ways uh, your place in the higher education uh, um, landscape of Canada. And uh, that is, um, um, there's some strains as a result of that. Because I think for a long time you were in a seller's market you were the dominant uh, university of the Maritimes region. And I don't think you had to work as hard to market yourself. But now that you're in a national and international market, because we are one world, I think that's pushing you. And I think you're finding that uh, students won't come to you just because you say you're Dow. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I have some cognitive dissonance with that whole concept. What does Dow mean? I've been asking different groups what it meant. And it wasn't until the last session I had this afternoon <clears throat> that I had a recent graduate tell me that for him, it meant coming here and really buying in and experiencing um, um, a mantra of the institution that I hadn't heard about before the end of the day today, which is citizen leader. Dal is about producing citizen leaders. Have you heard that? You know about that? Why didn't I hear about that before today? I mean, before 4 o'clock this afternoon, 3.30, 3.15, okay? Uh, so I was curious as to what's being done in the individual faculty um, levels 
to um, bring to life and to bring to fruition the notion of citizen leader. Uh, one of the things companies and governments and communities want, they want leaders. I think there's no more important outcome of higher education in our two countries uh, than the kind of leaders we produce. But I'm very concerned that when institutions market something and they tell their publics that the institution is going to deliver on A, B, and C, how do the institutions actually, do they deliver on A, B, and C? Or do they provide other experiences that may not be related to what students were told the place was all about? So the, the last session I had today was with your university and student affairs uh, marketing and communications uh, professionals. And I shared with them and also one other group an exercise that I've seen some campuses do where uh, I recommend that you uh, do some focus groups and you ask students what you think they were, what, excuse me, what they think they were promised when they came here. What did they come expecting? What had, what had been implanted on them? What's the reputation? How is the place marketed? And what did the university deliver in terms of the promise? And what we find is if there's a gap between the promise and what resulted, you have what in consumer terms is called potentially is buyer's remorse. There's a level of dissonance and people concluding that it isn't what I thought it was gonna be. Uh, and obviously the, the, the natural state of affairs is to deliver what you thought the place marketed. Now, I talked to one faculty member. Um, Fiona has taught me a lot about language here. And one of the things she's taught me to say is faculty member, when I mean one person whose role is teaching and research. And one faculty member uh, expressed concerns to me about uh, what this faculty member perceived in her faculty uh, was lack of input on the marketing message for the institution and therefore um, lack of clarity on what they were, they were expected to deliver. Um, that, that's really important, okay? I, I don't know that that's the case at all, but that's something that institutions really have to uh, keep working on. So he, here you are, you're 198 years old, and uh, you've got one of the most important things in marketing. You've got, you got location, 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 right? You're on the beach, but you're not a beach campus, right? You're on the ocean. And compared to much of the rest of the Canada, I guess we could say your climate is moderate, huh? not moderate. Uh, I've, I've never been here in the winter. I actually, when I arrived yesterday, I thought I'd arrived in the winter. I didn't see any leaves and I'd left, you know, full foliage. Um, but, but still, you're, you're an attractive city. And uh, we know that college students today, the majority of them, majority of them want to be in urban areas. There's more to do. And we know that uh, men tend to function less well in rural areas. They find there's not a lot, enough to do, and that's one of the reasons they leave. And uh, so your, your urbanness probably works better for the majority of your students, although it's an, a, a challenge for some of your students who come from rural parts, particularly of your, of your host province. But overall, I see your uh, location as an advantage. Uh, you started as a provincial institution, you became a regional institution, and now you're a national and international university. And uh, um, some of the way you talk about yourselves still reminds me of a smaller, more local place than a large national place. And m my hunch is about you that in a lot of the ways you're operating, you have many of the same policies and practices and culture that you had probably in the 1950s and 1960s. And you're probably operating under a lot of rules that you haven't changed. But because your students are different and you're now communicating in an international marketplace, you do need to be doing some things differently. And, and you are some things, but not others. And by that, I mean especially, I think you've carried on very well. Um, you have a culture of where students are told that they're coming here and they're gonna have lots of freedom and lots of choices. And they like coming to an urban area where many of them have freedom to do things they don't have, they can't do at home. And they are in an environment that gives them an enormous range of choices. You have 180 majors for undergraduates, right? I think I've got that count, right? That's a lot of choices. Um, but what I don't find is that you are highly intentional about making sure the students understand many of these choices and options for them. They are kind of, 
dropped off here and they are allowed to fend. And a lot of this fending for themselves is in a kind of Darwinian fashion where the fittest are surviving better than those that are not as fit. And one of the reasons this happens is, I mean, you, you have plenty of data that shows about the impact and the predictors of previous academic performance and previous socioeconomic status, okay? So um, in some ways, the advantage become um, even more advantaged. Um, but what, what I find is that you're, you're not making your students do um, very many things. It, most things here are optional. And you want them to take advantage, and you're providing your opportunities for them, but you're leaving them entirely to the student discretion. And I, I think that's something where you need to, you need to work on. Um, uh, another advantage you have is the connection between uh, research and teaching. And one of the things that is most appealing to a growing number of students now is to be in an undergraduate setting where they can do research and where they can get a, an advanced taste of graduate school and where there is a possibility to do what we call undergraduate student faculty research. And that is one of the 10 so-called high impact practices that have been found to uh, correlate with significantly higher levels of student satisfaction and academic attainment, particularly when undergraduate um, student research is provided for students from lower socioeconomic abilities, all right, who may be less abilities and not, not academic intellectual abilities, but in terms of their financial means and their cultural capital. When those students get in a structured relationship with somebody like me or many of you, it changes how they engage in the university. And you as a research university have the opportunity to provide that, okay, in a ways that the smaller institutions in the maritime regions, uh, region um, cannot do. And I, I see that um, uh, as an advantage. Um, you you uh, have a leadership currently that has been willing to invest a lot of personnel time and money into a critical examination of how you're functioning. An example, you have created the Dow Analytics Unit. We have two uh, gentlemen leaders over here from that unit. There are about 10 of you, give or take, is that correct? Uh, yeah, and um, that's a substantial investment in learning more about how we function. You, you have a president right now who has set as one of the norms here that we're gonna study ourselves and we're gonna collect data and we're gonna do a better job of making uh, decisions based on data and evidence. Is that correct? Is that how you see the culture? All right, I am not, I, I think this message has uh, fallen on receptive ears uh, with the people that report directly to him or at the most senior levels. I'm not sure how far down the chain that's gone. Okay, I don't know whether there are a significant number of people in the faculty's level that um, um, are talking about what they want to do based on the evidence that they know has been collected. I, they, they may be doing that, but I don't know that they're doing it. Although I have met here uh, one um, faculty member who's not here right now, who uh, has, um, she's in the faculty of science, who's uh, made it a passion to get access to as much of university data as she can to understand how the place is functioning and how she can use that to help her know where to best focus her energies. And I think that's uh, highly commendable. And I, I suggested in one of the groups this morning that I wondered if you might want to create a somewhat larger group of uh, faculty, excuse me, Fiona, faculty member users of uh, this wonderful data that you're accumulating that would fall within your institutional permission guidelines for who could have this information and how you could use it. Um, so uh, I, I, a strength, obviously, from the point of view of the reason I was asked here, that your president's 1.1 priority is the priority of retention. Um, that, hopefully, if he has any influence, that will make a difference here. And I know there are a number of people that see that they are accountable to him uh, on this. Uh, again, am I correct? And um, is that your sense? Uh, um, okay. All right. So I see that as a strength. Another strength that is so obvious to you and so fundamental to your mission that you may be just taking it for granted is that you are a residential university. And one of the things we know in both of our countries is that one of the best predictors of who's going to get a degree from college, university, is where you live. 
on-campus residence correlates with degree attainment. And the longer time you have in residence, the more likely you are to earn a degree. And why is that? Because on-campus residence is a way of further integrating students and changing their identities into a, the identity of a person who's committed to being in this environment. Now, one of the things that I'm seeing in, in really progressive undergraduate rethinking is uh, if we know this correlation, it's real, it exists, what could we do to further leverage residential environments to make them even more supportive of the academic mission? And um, you have a brand new uh, residence, uh, uh, residences director here. He came from Queens University. Um, I don't know enough about what goes on in residence halls here to know how we're integrating this into uh, the academic mission. But I have talked with him today about that. I've hooked him up with one of the deans to talk specifically about how we could launch something new this fall to get students, residential students in FAS more integrated into certain residential experiences that would support their academic experiences in that unit. That is a no-brainer. That must be done, okay? Uh, the residential environment is where your students spend more time than any single other area of their life in university. All right, so how is that connected to supporting the academic mission? It's a great strength of yours. The question is, I don't, I don't, know, uh, I don't know what you're doing with it. Uh, another strength that I see uh, in you is that one of the qualities of undergraduate education that we know has a, a very positive impact on students is the extent to which they engage with people who are different from them, all right? A lot of evidence about that. And you have a national student body and you have an international student body. So the potential here to expose your experience, students to people who are different and ideas and cultures that are different from the one they came in with, the ones they came with, is much greater than in most institutions. So again, I, I would hope you could do uh, even more of that. Another uh, strength that you have from a point of view of retention is that uh, students want to stay in a place where they have many choices. Even if they don't opt for those many choices, they like being in a place where they got lots of options. You have got lots of options, right? You really excel at that. Another strength of yours, uh, compared to the majority of Canadian post-secondary institutions, all, there are only 14 that are uh, essentially uh, comparable or more than you in this respect is one of the characteristics of institutions that has the biggest impact on retention is the degree of selectivity, degree of selectivity. The more selective you are, generally the more likely you are to retain students. Why? Because selectivity is generally a proxy for prior pre-university academic preparation and family wealth, okay, which are two outstanding predictors for degree attainment, all right? And you are quite selective. You, uh, you have a median entering high school uh, GPA of approximately 85, okay? Now, admittedly, an 85 from a rural public school uh, in New Brunswick may not be the same as a, uh, um, an 85 from Oakville or Burlington, Ontario where the family demographics, uh, the, you know, the income demographics and the quality of the public schools uh, may be much more advantaged. So, but it's still 85. So compared with many universities, for, and compared, with, say, with the colleges in Canada, you're, you've got some very strong uh, entering raw materials to work with. So I see that what, whatever you do is um, um, you got a lot to build on. Now, you also have a strong tradition here of autonomy and academic freedom. And I get the feeling that um, people in the faculty units here, um, they can pretty well do what they want to do as long as it's educationally legitimate, all right? So the question is, in a, in, an, in a lifestyle, in a culture like this, where you're giving not only the students, but you're giving your faculty a great deal of freedom, the question is, what are they doing with it? What do they want to do with it? Because there, there aren't, Compared to most of their occupations they could have, there aren't the constraints on how they might uh, apply their craft of being a university professor. Does that make sense to you? Uh, freedom is one of the greatest gifts we give people in democracies. The question is, what do you do with your freedom? All right? I, I think this is one of the most important questions that, that college students uh, need to be thinking about. All right, so um, a few other uh, 
general impressions. Um, I'm struck with the, uh, the high aspirations of your institution. You're in the U15, and uh, you, you want to be in the top 100 institutions uh, in the world. Uh, you're not a place that's characterized by um, modest aspirations. Nobody gets anywhere ahead on low aspirations, all right? So I see that as a strength. Um, I think that uh, I've met many people who are asking the right questions. Uh, almost always, I think the questions are more important than the answers. If you ask the right questions, you're going to get at what motivates people. And what needs to motivate people around student retention is what does this professor, what would she be most willing to do in her discretionary time within her means and ability in what we in the social sciences call locus of control, what would she most like to do with her freedom to help be more successful as students? And I think uh, she and others are asking the right questions about what we as individuals uh, could do. Uh, you are doing this in a data-rich environment. You know more about yourselves than most universities I go to, okay? Most universities don't have the, uh, the degree of knowledge that I see here, uh, and I think that is a, a tremendous strength. Another characteristic about you uh, is that you are, to understate the matter, you are highly decentralized. You are kind of like Oxford and Cambridge. You are a confederation of uh, largely autonomous fiefdoms who have enormous uh, flexibility, all right? And you have so much flexibility and so much autonomy that it prevents you from having very much consistency. So when I look at certain core functions that affect students. As I saw this afternoon in a session that was described to me one hour later by one of the participants in that session with one adjective, and that adjective was turbulent, okay? Not my words, this was the words of one of the participants. And this was a session about advising. And so advising here is a cottage industry, all right? There is no consistent university-wide understanding and definition or philosophy or mission around academic advising, okay? That's a problem, ladies and gentlemen, because one of the uh, experiences that undergraduate students have that is most likely to be correlated with academic success and degree attainment is what happens to them in academic advising. So you, you're a highly decentralized unit. The flip side of that is if you're highly decentralized, it means that people have a tremendous amount of freedom and one of the things we don't want to screw up in North America's great research universities is we don't want to screw up the freedom because it's the freedom that we professors have that leads to the big discoveries, right? And the big ideas. And they improve our society, all right? So we, we don't want to mess with academic freedom. But at the same time, there is the question, are, are your students, are they entitled to some minimum degrees of quality or commonality in some of the core experiences that they all need, like advising. Orientation would be another one. Uh, I am so um, impressed with your, um, uh, the freedom you give students, how little you make all of them do that I have been thinking of you as the university of laissez-faire. Um, one of the things you, a big step you've made is when I ask you, where do you know that students are most likely to fail here? Some of you can tell me. You do have data on that. These two guys know a great deal about where your students fail. And all of you could be learning a lot more from them about where they fail. And you're, the failures here are quite predictable. There are long established patterns of failure. You got 10 years of data on where they fail and don't fail, correct, John? Yeah, okay. So at least you know that. But by and large, uh, with the exception of some of the um, initiatives that the, uh, uh, the Teaching Learning Center uh, has initiated, and I have no idea what percent of the faculty, Brad, that you have reached, okay? I, I don't have a clue. But uh, I know mostly what the university is doing is your, and I've used this language, I'll continue to use it, you're treating the symptoms of where the students are running into the greatest uh, obstacles to their success. And you treat the symptoms by tutoring, through supplemental instruction, 
through Counseling Center. We learned yesterday that you have a disproportionately very high level of students who report anxiety as their principal complaint. Uh, we also learned that your students have a long wait to see a, a, a psychologist. Uh, most of you know that anxiety is very debilitating and it's disruptive of uh, effective study habits, okay? And I personally think that the amount of freedom you're giving them is one of the causes of their anxiety because they're more likely to not have direction and they're floundering and, and uh, uh, you're not doing enough to, um, to, to reduce that. So one of the things that I think you have to do to go to the next level is I think you have to identify some of the, what my former president uh, euphemistically called a coalition of the willing. Uh, in this case, of high status faculty members who have the professional security, typically they need to be full professors, who, and who have department heads who would sponsor them to get into some serious um, uh, self-study and deconstruction of existing courses that would lead to course redesign. I think you need to redesign a number of your courses. And I think if you do that, you're going to impact your DWF rates, okay? Because I think you have the expertise here to do that, but you haven't done it yet, and you need to do it, in my not-so-humble opinion. Okay, so uh, it, you, you know, there's no question, you, you know where the students are not being successful. Uh, but you, you like uh, many universities, um, you have developed a tolerance for failure. And many of us in the academic world think it's a, it's a kind of, I call it an academic uh, social Darwinism. We believe that the fittest will survive. And some of us believe that it is ordained that the fittest should survive and that they will survive and there's nothing we should do to intervene, okay? We just need to let it happen. I don't believe that because I have seen uh, a very significant number of interventions that change those Darwinian trajectories. Is that clear? And I think course design is one of them. All right, now this matter of um, uh, trying to increase, increase uh, student retention, uh, this is the holy grail of higher education. It is an elusive and ephemeral uh, chase. And uh, it, it's a search for magic bullets. And in my country now, and increasingly in your company, country, a Freudian slip, there are a number of for-profit companies who will be happy to sell you fixes, very expensive fixes, uh, to improve your retention. And I want to tell you, if you buy any of these, I've got some great swamp land on the top of my mountain, OK? that I'd be happy to sell you, okay? Uh, in other words, there's no swamp on the top of my mountain, all right? Uh, the, 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 the fix for this issue is with you. And you don't really have to buy anything, okay? Because you got all the talents and the resource and the intellectual expertise you need right here because you're a research university. Now, there are some uh, strategies. Uh, I'm going to end these remarks soon with what are some, what I'll call some uh, kind of my uh, concluding recommendations. But I would just like to mention that uh, what, what are the most common options that colleges and universities are pursuing to try to um, leverage uh, student retention? And let's kind of look at these and see which ones you're using. Uh, one uh, intervention that many universities are using and getting good outcomes from is the uh, use of what's called supplemental instruction. We've talked about that in several of the sessions. You are using supplemental instruction here. Uh, I don't have any idea as to how extensively you're making supplemental instruction available, uh, you know, how many courses you've targeted for SI. I don't have a clue about any of that. But I know that SI is something you know about and that you've been using. And it's a very powerful uh, intervention. I know that you're beginning to experiment with what are uh, broadly called learning communities or FIGs, first year interest groups, or simply interest groups. And I can tell you that there's a very significant body of research that says if you get more students involved in learning communities, you will keep more of your students. Learning communities are linked paired courses with 15 or 20 or more students who take at least two courses together, sometimes three, four, five courses, and often linked to where they live. I learned that you are doing no academic registration of students in academic credit-bearing classes as a function of where students live. What a wasted opportunity. It's a wasted opportunity 
because you had students taking anything together as a small course that's connected to where they live, they could be doing some academic work together in the residence hall. All right? We, we know that the more time and energy students spend on doing academic work, their, the outcomes increase. And if you can carry it into the residence halls, that's hugely important. One of the efforts that some colleges are making to change the culture of residence halls is to uh, pursue a, a British tradition. And I didn't know you were doing this at all today until I, I, well, I can't tell you how many serendipitous conversations I've had with people. These are my favorite parts of visits like this. And I learned just very casually that in one um, element of Dalhousie University, you have what's called a residential don. Do any of you know where you have a residential don? A residential don is an adult, an educator, who lives in residence with your undergraduates. Where do you have a residential don? Hmm? Is it in Hall? Is it where? Is it one of our residences called Hall? No, it's not. Where is it? It's in Bridgeton. Pardon me? Oh, I, I may be there. I don't know. I, but they're technically not Dalhousie University, right? They're not part of Dalhousie officially. Yes. They're no, they're related. They're very ambiguously related, uh, as I've learned uh, more and more about this. Okay, sir? Yes, thank you. At the Truro campus of Dalhousie University in your agriculture school, all right? And you have a residential don. Now, I think that's the best concept since sliced bread. You should have residential dons in your residence halls here. Why? Because one of the keys to um, increasing student performance is more out of class interaction with faculty and not faculty being there to manage discipline or deal with plumbing problems, but simply to be there available for conversation, informal interaction. And many of Amer North America's great universities have faculty living in residence, okay? And you have residence halls, so, so you could be doing that. Now, somebody said to me today, I will protect them and they will rename, remain nameless, that the, cri the pri prim primary criteria for the design consideration of residential facilities was how you could convert that facility into a cash machine, okay? Now, if you have a residential facility for uh, an adult educator, you have to take a few beds offline. You're gonna have to sacrifice some revenue for an apartment for a professor to live with his or her family and pet, dog, or cat, and children, whomever, okay? But the impact of that on the institutional culture, I would argue, in terms of student learning and campus culture, is worth the revenue that you forfeit. Uh, your mission is not just to make money, right? The last time I looked, you're in the learning business, correct? You're not an ATM machine, okay? I don't mean to sound scolding, but it's, the question here is, what, what are your primary values? What are you using to make decisions? If you were using as a primary criteria for how you designed your residence halls, how we'd cre <coughs> create a facility in which people learned that residence hall might look quite differently than a residence hall that's designed to make money. Is, is that clear? All right, so <clears throat> another intervention that 90% uh, of the institutions in my country are using that they're getting very significant retention outcomes from <clears throat> is a credit-bearing course to teach students how to do college. These are called first-year seminars, college success courses, university seminar courses. They have a number of different names. They're all, they're all trying to do the same thing. You don't have anything like that here, but you could. You could be teaching students how to do college. You could be teaching them about what are all these opportunities they have. You could also be teaching them how to reduce their anxiety. You don't have any preventive health interventions right now in the form of credit-bearing courses that students have to do. And so what they can do is go in for treatment, all right? But you don't have enough people on the lines of treatment, all right? So you really need a college success course. You, you don't have one. Um, <clears throat> you, um, uh, another thing that colleges are doing, uh, universities, I know I'm using those terms ch interchangeably, technically they're not interchangeable, is a concept called summer bridge. A summer bridge is the idea that there are certain students who would benefit greatly if you brought them in advance of matriculation and you had them live on a university campus for four to eight weeks and take one to two credit courses and live in a residence hall with other college students and live in a residence hall with outstanding upperclassmen and women. 
who would provide outstanding peer role model leadership for them as they enter an, enter an institution. You have one faculty here, hooray, that's actually talking about doing a summer bridge. That's how they should be using their freedom, okay? I think if you were to do more of that, that, that would pay off for you. We've been doing summer bridges in my country since 1965. And the main reason we started them was it was a natural companion to the Civil Rights Act that was adopted the year before in 1964. And we realized that for students who previously had been deprived access to higher education, in the name of social justice, we had to be doing more for some than they were for others. Another pedagogy that's being widely used in the US that we're finding that correlates very positively with, with retention is a pedagogy called service learning. Service learning is a pedagogy where you mandate in your professorial capacity that the students in your course will engage in non-remunerative, uh, involuntary, not voluntary, but involuntary service. And to do that service work, they, they usually do it off campus, sometimes they do it on campus, but to do it, they've got to have some out interaction outside of class with faculty. And they've also got to have interaction outside of class with other students, and they've also got to have outside of class uh, interaction with student affairs colleagues. Now, what's so powerful about student lear service learning? Service learning requires students to go out and observe various uh, human social contexts of which you have a laboratory here in Halifax and to, con to uh, connect those um, observations with the goals of the course and to think about what you're learning and to engage in a kind of uh, learning that's called reflective learning, reflective practice. And Brad could offer you a whole professional development workshop on the power of reflective learning, correct? Couldn't you, Brad? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, so reflective learning uh, requires that you do something with your reflections. It requires you share them with other students and that you write them and you speak them, all right? So service learning is a pedagogy that correlates with a lot of other things that have been shown to enhance uh, student persistence. Uh, let me show you another interesting, uh, this is just a little factoid. Uh, I don't know if anybody ever, anybody ever heard of this guy, but he was a Harvard professor who uh, did more research on uh, the phenomena that Canadian students really enjoy. It's something called binge drinking. And to look at the behavioral outcomes that correlate with binge drinking. And one of the many things he found about binge drinking, this is at the Harvard School of Public Health, uh, Google him. And uh, uh, he found that uh, one of the best predictors of a student who uh, would engage in less time in binge drinking is a student who engages in five or more hours a week of service learning. Now, what might be the correlation between a student engaging in service learning, like maybe working in a soup kitchen, and how much beer they chug, okay? You, you, you can figure that out, all right? So service learning is a, is a stunning uh, pedagogy, and it's one of many that we could be, we could be using. Uh, we spend a lot of time here talking about academic advising. That's a signature focus on uh, enhancing, enhancing retention. One of your units, one of your 12 faculties, is launching a structured process for mentorship Students who are mentored are found to be more likely to persist than students who do not have a mentor. Uh, another big development uh, is realizing that students learn more from uh, other students than any other source of learning in the institution and the growing use of student leaders, peer leaders, as uh, partners in faculty uh, with faculty members, upper class students, outstanding students, joining the uh, and supporting the teaching learning uh, uh, functions. Okay, one other that uh, I've talked, well actually two more that I've talked about is uh, we know that certain rules make students do things that if they do those things they're going to be more likely to be retained in college. And there, there are a lot of rules and you have rules and I don't know what most of them are, but you have rules that uh, are things like how late can you start class? How late in the term can you register and start class? And our two friends in data analytics, they can probably tell you what, exactly what the academic performance of students is at the end of the first term as a, a function of when they start class. And you know, I'm curious as to whether you ever look at that data in terms of your thinking about what's your policy around last date to register. How late do you allow students to stay in a course and drop that course without a penalty? Do you have any cohorts of students here for whom you have an attendance policy? I've learned in my visit that you have no required behaviors at all of students who are on academic probation, okay? 
I can't imagine that. I was on academic probation. My first semester, I got three Fs, two Ds, and an A. I told somebody this yesterday. God, was I a sharp student, okay? And I was put on probation. They didn't make me do anything. It's amazing I ever got off probation. And I credit three things with getting me off probation. Number one, I had found an outstanding academic advisor. He helped me. He motivated me. He had me to his home for meals. I got to know his wife and kids. I would not let him down. Secondly, I had an advisor and an upper class student who helped me pick professors. They showed me how to predict, pick professors who would rattle my cage and get me engaged. And I got so engaged and transformed when I got home after the first semester of college, my father did not recognize me and he did not like what college had done to me, okay? All right, the third thing uh, that happened to me was I had an upper class student who noticed that I wasn't taking any notes. And he said to me, John, I notice you're failing this course. And I also notice you're not taking any notes. And in my immature, wise, 17-year-old way, him, I said, so what? And he said, look at my notes. Let me show you how I do this. This is a guy who was an A student, all right? He was also an athlete, star athlete. I looked at those notes, and I was like an evangelical Christian. It was the revealed word right there. Okay, I'd never seen anything like it. I thought if he could do it, I could do it. I started copying his note-taking techniques. Finally, my grades improved when I learned how to take notes. I'm still a compulsive note-taker, okay? So um, the, the, what are your policies that connect to students? You have a lot of access policies. You function like an open admissions institution. Sorry to tell you. You're, you're, it's a paradox. Your selective admissions, you have lots of requirements to get them in the door, but after they get in the door, you function like an open access institution. And open access institutions in both our countries have very few rules. They don't make students do anything. They let them, it's a free for all. Okay, uh, another thing that we're finding impacts student persistence uh, in a big way is student employment, on-campus employment. Because on-campus employment puts students around people like us. And how are you leveraging on-campus employment? All right, okay, so in conclusion, I'm finally here. Uh, um, and these are just my conclusions, and what matters is the conclusions that your various work groups, your um, early alert group, your holistic advising group, your uh, group that's working on orientation, any other uh, group processes you have to move forward. What matters is you have a 1.1 strategic priorities group. I just got started in a conversation with them today. I asked them, what do you want to do? What do you most want to do? You've got to decide that. And we didn't get any further than talking about um, how they were going to successfully implement uh, learning communities, first-year interest groups, okay? And that was very important to do that. But we were just getting started on the list of what could be done. So here's what I think you need to do. I think you need a comprehensive plan. You don't have one right now. You got a, uh, you've had several consulting firms. Um, they've given you a lot of recommendations. You've got 150 or so recommendations. You can't digest that. You have to distill this down to uh, five, eight, ten core themes that you're going to be able to tell everybody are going to be key areas for focus to move this needle, all right? And you're not there yet, all right? And so uh, one of the things I'm hoping is that after this visit, you will be uh, more inclined to make some decisions about what you want your priorities to be in the, in the near term going forward, okay? Uh, the second, you know, by the way, I... I've done um, strategic planning around the first year with 275 uh, colleges and universities since 2003, all but seven of them in the United States. And one of the things I know is, as I have empirical data, I had a big data researcher at uh, Purdue University to do this analysis for me, I can tell you there's a direct correlation between the extent to which colleges and universities execute their plans and persistence rates. High implementers are the big gainers in retention. Medium, low, no implementers, zilch. Some of them even experience declines in retention. Why? Because they can't implement their aspirational visions. We educators, we're, we are great dreamers and schemers. We can come up with all kinds of ideas. The question is, how good are we at the execution? All right? And that's your, you've got a lot of options right now. You've got a lot of data and you have to translate them into execution. So I think you need a plan, you need to execute that plan, you gotta act on the data you have, and you're gonna to have to act on some things that you may not have any data for at all. Right now, you don't have any data on whether students would be more or less successful if you made them do things because you're not making them do things. 
And you won't know that until you have a control group where you've made some students do some things. Correct, gentlemen? Okay. And you need some control groups so you can test out some of these, uh, these wild-haired ideas that this guy from the States came down and pitched to you, okay? Or came up from the States and pitched to you. Uh, so um, you, you, there's some things, though, you, you need to do, even without data, because you believe they are educationally pr appropriate, they're morally ethical. Like one I keep asking you to think about, you're, you're admitting these students, you're taking their hopes, their dreams, their money, you're putting them in debt, and there's some things you're not doing for them. You're not guaranteeing every one of them advising. You're not guaranteeing every, every, every one of them uh, orientation. You're not guaranteeing them um, something other than a roulette. In a roulette in the first year, in high failure rate course, it's a form of roulette. Which section they get in, which course, they're rolling the dice. And your data shows that they roll the dice, right? I haven't seen your data, but, but I know it does. It shows that in any given courses, the DDUFI rate may, may vary anywhere from 7 or 8% to 90%. It's roulette, okay? But we created that, we can change that. So you need a plan, you need to execute the plan, you need to pilot some of these initiatives that you haven't tried before. And I have right here a brave soul who's going to pilot something, okay? And we need to help her and support her and be interested, and when she asks us for help, we need to give it to her, okay? Right? Right, and you've had volunteers today. We've had volunteers from Student Services, we've had the University Librarian, volunteer. Um, the data guys are going to volunteer. It uh, takes a whole village to raise a successful pilot. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, just a couple more things. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, eventually you've got to decide that if you're, if you're really going to uh, significantly move the needle, there are some things you have to decide you're going to do for all students. You can't just do for some students. So uh, you're more likely to get the money from the people of Nova Scotia to do what they want done for all students than just for a boutique. I, I had a really neat conversation, I thought it was, I don't know what she thinks, but with the university librarian this morning. And you have a common reading initiative, correct? And your common reading program though, it involves a relatively small subsection of your population. That's an example of something you have to scale because when you do a common reading at the beginning of the university experience, it sends the message to students that a university is a place where our stock and trade is in ideas. And we come together with people called professors and students and outstanding older students and these people called student affairs that we never had any of them in high school. They don't have student affairs professionals in high school. And we come together to discuss ideas. All right, and we do that in a common reading initiative. There are all kinds of ways you could get more students involved in your common reading, and you need to do that. Okay, so scaling is very important. Um, you really, I know this is a drum I've been beating, you have to focus on your high failure rate courses. That I think is, of all the things I'm talking about, is the most important. I think you could become, uh, you, you need more qualitative data on the student experience. Uh, maybe I saved the best to last, I don't know. I got in a discussion with the last group today and one of them used the phrase, you gotta be careful what you say to me because I'll nail it. They, 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 a student referred to the DAL experience. I said, yeah, what's the DAL experience? Tell me what the DAL experience is. Uh, the more data, you got wonderful qualitative data. You really gotta work on your quantitative data, your qualitative data, not your quantitative, your qualitative data to get more insight on what that, uh, what that DAL um, experience is. Um, and you won't get that, you can only get that by asking the students. I'll give you an example, and I probably ought to close with this. Uh, some years ago, Virginia Commonwealth University in Virginia uh, did a, an assessment process that they called the First Year Prompts Project. And they had a required first year English course, which 3,000 or more students, they all took that. And each week for 16 weeks, they gave all 3,000 students a prompt, and the students uh, filled out the prompt. And then they put together a team to analyze the student responses to the prompts. And one of the prompts was, and I quote, large classes are, large classes are, and you'd think that Brad wrote this, but he wasn't there. And one of the 3,000 students answered that prompt by saying large classes are for teaching, not learning. And that, more than anything that was said out of 3,000 times 16, run the numbers, over 60,000 
statements that they read, that was the one that leapt out and they said, we're going to do something about that. Okay, so qual qualitative data is really powerful. When I heard that recent graduate say to me this afternoon something about citizen leader, and now this is a place that made him a citizen leader, I want to learn more about how that happened to him. What did you do? Because students, they're going to university, to, they want to be leaders. They want it documented on their transcripts and on their diplomas. If they came somewhere and it made me a leader, because I'm more likely to get a job with Apple if I can document that, all right? So uh, folks, to be in this kind of work, you got to be an optimist, all right? You got to believe we can do anything we want to do, because we're very smart people. And I have had a number of people tell me the past two days that they think this place has the will, W-I-L-L, -L, and now you have to translate the will into action. And that's what we are going to be doing. And now that I say we, I've to totally lost my objectivity, uh, that you're going to do this year. You're going to move a number of these things into action. So. Those are my concluding thoughts, for now, unless you draw me out anymore. Anything you want to say? Does this, have I been talking about Dalhousie University? Steve, correct? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, I have to be an optimist. I've spent eight years of my life building the College of Sustainability. Yeah, and I was suggesting to one group this afternoon that they ought to be marketing your initiative in the States. Right. We're not mm -hmm. marketing. That's dumb. We're not examining it. Mm -hmm. We're not, uh, and every decision that comes down, mm -hmm. the challenge to me is why are you not doing things according to the norms of the university? So pilot, like pilot projects are great, but pilot projects that don't have a serious kind of recovery, some kind of reference. I mean, I, I for me, uh, the existence of the Dell Analytic State is really important because we didn't have it when we started this thing. Correct. And it's important to track that. But Very important base, yes. The kind of qualitative dimension to know what we are doing that is successful. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know that we have enough of a sense of how things are being done to know why those numbers are bad there and why the numbers are not so bad there. But there is. Are you involved in any of the groups that are working with these guys? Uh, I think they take. I'm not in the faculty. Therefore, I don't exist administratively. No, no. Oh, okay. I don't really I'm understand that. This okay. For five years. Okay. I don't. So we finally were president. So this, this is, there, there's an issue there. And the mm -hmm. issue relates to, a, so one issue that I think is really, really important is if we're going to do things, mm -hmm. we have to find a way to examine them and share them anecdotally. Because yeah. for most colleagues, uh, quantitative data alone will not move anyone's heart mm -hmm. without a story of the compelling. There needs to be a narrative with it, yes. I think the quantitative, excuse, yeah, the quantitative data that you have here, which has not yet been shared publicly, on a 10-year history of DWF rates uh, as a function of race, gender, ethnicity, uh, provincial status, I think that would move. I think that uh, will capture your social justice inclinations. I think it's going to upset you, a number of you. I, I think it will move you, but you have to see the data, all right? So and you have to be convened to talk about it. That's right. So I mean, so to finish the thought, one, one thing is we, we have uh, higher retention rates in our program. We have higher success rates in our mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. We're not sharing that information about how we're doing it. Um, the second point I would make. But do you do you think do you uh, have you got a hypothesis of what your secret sauce is to make that barbecue? Uh, it's all, it was laid out for lobster, huh? Okay. With a thundering silence. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is sounding cynical, but we're amongst friends here, right? This is a real problem. Mm -hmm. The second problem that relates to this, I think, is um, because because of the, the goodwill cost and the opportunity. Right? If people do good things and nobody seems to learn from them, then we come in and say, we've got this terrible problem and we don't know what to do. Well, we've been doing it. And it's not just us. There are other programs doing interesting sure. things that we haven't tracked as a collective. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's an issue. The second issue that I see, and it relates directly. But be, excuse me. Before you leave that, I just want to get back to one theme that I mentioned at my opening my comments about where you are in the university's history, the length of time your president's been here, the focus on this uh, strategic plan, the um, the priorities, what they are. Um, what what's happening here is that leaders of uh, universities are becoming more, in, much more impatient with student failure, and these leaders are changing the way universities are being managed, and they are having to um, interfere with, uh, and I'm sorry, you may not like that word, but they're having to 
um, intercede in areas in which previously we had all kinds of unregulated freedom to do exactly as we pleased, and they were funding this freedom, and they don't have the money now. And so they're becoming more selective, and they're saying, we are going to introduce uh, some expectations for who we give money to and how much money we give them. And what we're doing then is we're reducing our operational tolerance for failure. And that is beginning to happen at Dalhousie University. All right? And it's coming, folks. There isn't enough money around to give you all the money you want, no matter what you do. OK, go ahead, Steve. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. If you participate, you agree to that. Oh, sure. So, um, so the second point I would say is that um, you've talked about the um, unregulated freedom of students and the faculty. Mm -hmm. You would say that an equal problem is the unregulated or freedom of senior administration. There is no requirement to respond. There are, there are dictates, there are programs, mm -hmm. there are protocols, there are things that come down, but uh, there is very little responsiveness in my experience. Mm -hmm. Could you, if you, you, not only you, but others, could you uh, suggest means for um, more communication channels where you, the administration might have more opportunities to respond to people like you who uh, might want to ascertain their views about certain things? I mean, I think uh, things like, you know, kind of smaller scale, like mm -hmm. substantive town hall meetings or yeah. mm -hmm. meetings that mm -hmm. have an extraordinary Uh, one one uh, person in one of the groups to say today described Dalhousie University as a very very hierarchical status driven, meaning that there are very clear status differentiations, and you were expected not to step outside your status demarcation. Is that what you're telling me? I think that's part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then the other piece I would say that's that's actually really important and directly relates to our experience. We, we built uh, an operation and a budget that has a very rich relative to other units, staff present. Um, so highly and higher skilled staff right? mm -hmm. doing things like academic advising and community outreach. Mm -hmm. um, do, you have an, do you have an endowment that funds that? Uh, we do not. Mm -hmm. Basically, we're a strategic initiative okay. that's mm -hmm. now self-funded. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting, I mean, so, so we've been able to do some things that other units can't do, and as far as I can see, we'll never be able to do, because although there has been an enormous increase in the number of non-faculty salaries at Dalhousie, none of that has occurred at the faculty and down level. So that, that there is an extraordinary, a significant increase, and probably necessary at the time in the number of associate vice presidents, people reporting to them, people working in... All right, you, so you're saying the, the growth of non-faculty employees is, has outpaced the growth of faculty employees? I would say that's well, it's it's true across North America, yeah. Professorial faculty mm -hmm. employees have not increased. What and there are multiple reasons for that. And, and what it's also led to is an, ex, an extreme crunch point at the level of um, the two layers of academic mm -hmm. administrators who are required to go both ways. So okay. uh, deans, but especially chairs, yeah. the level of kind of uh, non-professorial one of, the, one of the, you know, I know we've, we faculty tend to think this diminution of the relative numbers of new faculty hires is overwhelming or even exclusively a function of um, finances. It's not. Part of it is a perception on the part of university leaders that if they sink more money in us, they're not going to get results. Okay? That we're, we're, we're not going to be doing the work that they want to see done to increase student success. And so they're more interested in hiring more people that they think are going to improve student success. So, so I'm not trying to justify that, but I am trying to explain it. Say it's the not hiring professors. I'm not saying that. Mm -hmm. I'm saying it's not hiring people who work with professors. Um, the people who are involved in the student success work and that kind of stuff you're talking about, 
don't report to us, don't report to chairs. So, so to do the kinds of things we're doing, I have several people who report to me whose jobs are student success, student yeah. engagement, okay. community, all the rest of that. Chris is not going to happen. Never going to happen. Oh, yes, I saw the siloing very dramatically this afternoon. Well, you know, you, at, the, at the university at its highest level has adopted a new structure where we've integrated the, uh, the academic and the student services function. That uh, integration, it's going to take a while for that to filter down to the faculties. But it is coming, all right, because that's the ultimate implication of this integration, okay? It just is taking a while to implement that, all right? Um, so what, what, do you folks, uh, there are po people here, are you, am I out of time? Do I need to go? We need to go? Okay. All right. No, it's okay. Why don't we take one more question? Thank you for the question you raised, Steve. Okay. Why don't we take one more question? Then we would need to wrap up. Okay. Two more meetings for John. Okay. Well, all right. Um, question, comment? Urge it. Yeah, so you do. Yeah, so it's, it's recommended. Mm -hmm. um, and we use words like required. But again, there's, if they don't show up. So mm -hmm. what would you say? We've got three months before our next coming, our incoming class. We're working with them over the course of the summer. What would you say, what would you recommend as kind of from a student affairs perspective? What do we do? What's the one thing that you think Thank you for, you know, ending this session with a really simple question for me. Uh, um, the one thing, well. Um, Maybe I can leave that with you, given that you'll be working with us over the next year. Yeah, uh, I think you're, the answer that you folks developed to that question is more important than anything I could tell you. But I'm not trying to beg off the question. I think the, uh, the integration of academic and student affairs uh, needs the help of a number of people now to develop a vision for how to do that below the provostial level. Okay, that's where it has to go. And you've got to take, you know, one level at a time. Um, it's very clear to me that advising is a, an area where there is enormous um, lack of consensus, lack of understanding, lack of any kind of shared uh, purpose and mission about how we work together on this. I mean, that's a, so one of the things you could be thinking about this summer is how uh, you as a division of student affairs and the deans of the faculties think about some significant adjustments in the organizational structures for the execution of advising. I've already suggested to the uh, dean of arts, arts and um, uh, social sciences and the chief uh, residential uh, um, facilities officer here to think about an intervention for fast students that would involve residence halls. We, um, there are several colleges this summer that are getting in place plans to pilot some uh, initiatives for this fall. Um, I, um, I think there's a number of things you can do immediately, but what you have to do is that uh, Anne and Fiona need to convene, solicit input, survey a number of you, get feedback about the subtitle of the book that I mentioned that was published Monday about what matters most. 
you have to decide of the, the options I've laid out. What do you, what do you think matters most? And because uh, le leadership, it's one of the examples I use all the time. I'm a f recovering former historian. Uh, I know what happened when Alexander Great announced he wanted to go to India. Right? He set off, and uh, with his army and his supply trains and his brothels and everything he needed to get to India. But his army sat down in the middle of the Persian desert and said, "We're not going any further." You know, leaders can only lead so far. They can't lead any further than the troops want to go, especially in higher education institutions. So I think the, there has to be a, um, a kind of uh, democratic group process here to get some input on what people are willing to work on and what people are willing to, uh, you know, some stakes, some, make some investment in. in. And we've, I pointed out to somebody here in the second row who's uh, made a commitment to do something this fall. And we, we have to identify what within your respective areas of locus of control um, could you be doing immediately and somewhat longer term. So in effect, we have to ask, we have to practice the volunteer syndrome, all right? Um, and I'm optimistic that that is will happen. Yes, okay. All right, so thank you very much. I will look forward to seeing what you do. And you will do something, correct? Yes, okay, all right. Okay, all right, well, thank you. You bet. <laughs>